Welcome back to High Performance Computing. This is our part two of the practical lecture 0.1, a very brief introduction to Unix and the SSH protocol. In the previous lecture, we basically, or in the previous part of the lecture, part one, we discussed a little bit the Unix um, environment and we basically motivated the point why we include this here in the course that when you have some Unix skills and the SSH skills, they are incredibly helpful if you want to access um, the Euro HPC supercomputers in the union, when you want to basically use a system here earlier at the university, um, but also if you want to have some smaller test clusters, perhaps like the deep system we revealed in the first part, that is more or less a test cluster of the modular supercomputing architecture, so not at all a Euro HPC system. But you will also learn later, uh, especially with the exascale system, Jupiter, which is also uh, following the modular paradigms. So um, we want to understand what this secure shell really entails. And uh, I just give you again the, the brief point that understanding SSH will help you a lot. Uh, basically, it's not just HPC material. Um, this is something which should be in the, let's say, um, computer science curricula from the very beginning. So the very first elements of computer science uh, curricula at the university properly in one way or another already is talking about SSH and remote access, um, about, you know, different IT security access paradigms of the systems which is related to it. So definitely something which maybe people today will call cybersecurity. I'm not an expert in that, but interesting to say is that HPC is really uh, requiring some security in that area because we have this extremely costly machines. I just want to um, again, scroll you um, a little bit through the world of European supercomputers. We had that already in the last lecture, but um, Think about that we have now access. You are a user of the Lumi system. You're based in Finland, and Leonardo in Italy. They all are very large systems uh, with, with lots of, um, you know, basically nodes and extremely much computing power. We will also review that again when we come really to the HPC. But you see like number two in the Europe, six globally from the top 500 supercomputers. So hence, you have access to a significant amount of computing. And this can be used in, in bad ways, or it could be used in ways which are not really for science and industry really useful, let's say for Bitcoin mining, right? So this is something where security is very important and not everybody should just simply hack these systems or access these systems. Hence, what is often done is that these systems are not like a typical cloud login, username, password driven. Rather, here you have really so-called SSH keys. And if you master the lecture of today, chances are that you really can use this knowledge on all these different systems of the Union, Mare Nostrum 5 in Spain, Meloxina, Luxembourg, Carolina here in the Czech Republic. Um, there we have many systems here in Europe that really enable the access to SSH. Maybe here and there, they would like to motivate the access with Jupyter Notebooks. We discussed this in the last part of the lecture. That is something where you can bypass a little bit the Jupyter Notebook, and we will show that also in our systems and our course later on. But chances are that in one way or another, you really have the opportunity to use SSH to really go remote. And this is now an important part of this lecture, right? Remote means we are basically leaving our laptop. We are leaving our desktop machine, whatever I am used to work with, and I'm entering a machine that is maybe here like Vega in Slovenia. So that is a example just of all of these systems, right? And it shows you that these systems is something where you have access to. Here's also a sneak preview of our Jupyter machine, um, one excerpt flop as I was motivating also, um, and even if you would say it's a very, let's say, cutting edge system will come probably this year or maybe at the beginning of next year, 2025. But chances are very high that you will have a system that you can access with SSH. So enough for the motivation. So we want to understand a little bit how it works. So hence, um, 
I don't dive also in the deep details of the SSH protocol. I just want to have the more usability approach here for us at HPC. That what matters to us, and we leave the expert uh, expertise, low level details for SSH for those that are really interested in IT security. Still, it is very important to understand how it works. Hence, we will look at it. And this is something what you basically see on the top right, right? You see here our one of our supercomputers. And you have basically your own machine, let it be a desktop computer or a laptop. And basically the way how you would do it is you have a certain private public key where we will talk about very soon about. But um, this keeper is something which uh, on your own laptop or on your desktop is always existing in both parts. You would have the private key and the public key. Now, what you would do you talk to an administrator, like from Elia or from the deep system, for instance, that we learned already in the first part. So, and you will provide the public key, right? So the public key means it's now on loaded on the system and the people will know that with your username, you have a certain public key. The public key you can give away, you can give it to administrators, you can give it um, to everyone who is requesting it if you want to have a remote machine access. However, and that's very important, the private key should be never basically leaving your system, right? So your own laptop, your own desktop machine, that should be the only one that has a private key. In other words, you. Never give your private key away. If we review now um, this basically on Elia, the documentation I provided in the other part of the of course, already you remember earlier the system here at the University of Iceland. You have a large, um, let's say, uh, supplementary information, really, how to use SSH, what are SSH keys, details on, on how to create them, and so on. But you see here the caution. You should, under no circumstances, share the content of your private key. Especially if someone wants to have it, it's completely untrue. Admins from HPC are very happy if they have the public key. They don't want your private key usually because they want to have your public key so that you have the private key and then matching those you can have access. So this is something it is very malicious if someone, an administrator, let's say fakes to wants to have the private key from you. That's definitely not the case. And we will see how that works. So you will see uh, that basically when you have this first step right, right? So you talk to the administrator of this particular HPC machine, you say, hey, I give you the public key under my name, and then basically I remain with a private key. So that's a sort of agreement that's done. Um, you give out the private, uh, the public key, you keep the private key, and, and that's good. Now, the second step is once you want to access this machine, you basically are confronted with a public key that is then coming basically because you uploaded it or you gave it to the administrator and only those with a matching private key which in of course uh, in the area of this particular security setup should be just one private key and is just one private key on your system which might be protected with a passphrase sometimes so this is the only way how to get as access hence you have a predefined setup as step one very important never give away the private key, always a public key. Second, you use basically your private key to match the public key you uploaded, and then you can access the system. Hence, your SSH client, because we're talking here about an SSH server that is installed and running, your SSH client that you have needs to have some information. And they are basically, um, three essential ones. You can boil it down to the three. You can have much, much more. You see here advanced settings, um, which lots of interesting elements like X11 forwarding for having also uh, then basically your, your kind of uh, Windows support. So you basically can see what graphics are there on the system, whatever. So there's this is a big topic. But if you want here in this course, which is very relevant just for accessing the HPC machines, we can live with this kind of three of important things. The first one is you need access to a remote host. And the remote host means the supercomputer or the cluster you access needs to have a name. We call that the remote host name. 
And if you remember, I had this already shown, this host name minus A in the Unix part was exactly alluding to this. So we have a certain name of the system we want to connect to. Of course, we, this system needs to be accessible. So we will do some small demo here on the command line. You see here a typical Windows shell command. Um, and we want to ping these systems and say is. I will make it a bit bigger here so that you can see that. Elia is this HPC system in Iceland. And you see it has a specific IP address. Um, and that means if you can ping it, it's basically also available. And in our case, it has also enabled the specific ports you need to have the SSH connection. Now, what happens? What, what is about the deep system we have sent? This is in Iceland, the Elia system. So now we want to switch to the German system, which is a Ulich one, um, this deep test cluster, if you remember. It's also available under different IP address. Now, I don't want to make now a big, you know, demo about what, what is now an IP address, what is a host name. This is really fundamental uh, computer science. So we, we basically know how the web, World Wide Web works and we assume it's working. So let's turn back um, also to our um, systems. But this is, of course, the first information, the first ingredient we need. Then the second ingredient is we need a specific username. And this usually happens at this period first process part. So once you ask the administrator for an account, um, or basically here in the course, you will get equipped with an account automatically because we will give it to you. Um, it will be a host name that you need, but also your private name, right? So your specific username. And this is unique on the system. Right? There's no one else who calls, for instance, Morris. Um, it could be not only your real name. It could be a complete, let's say, absurd uh, coded num number. It could be something else that you can't really steer. In some other systems, I'm real one, as you will see. So it is something which it's basically on the edge of your control. But if you have an account on the system, which is basically the first start before you use SSH, you will know your username. The administrators will say, well, we have an account called Morris now, and you can use it on Elia. What we also said is in the beginning, that there should be a public key to it. So this is a topic where there are lots of documentation here on the site um, of Elia, how to basically you know, use that with Unix. You see here, SSA key gen, how you generate keys, that's all nicely documented from my colleagues uh, from the university here, from the IT department, that really show you how a key can be created. And I don't want to repeat that all because it's a interesting, let's say, um, exercise to do. And what you end up with, this is you know, the more important part, is usually you have two files which are of significant importance. So you would have a public key. And it's no trouble that I open this in a, in a basically recording here. Um, this is a public key string from me, and it will show you a specific system, uh, et cetera. But more importantly, this is a particular part of the key that I can now share in public because I am the only one that has the private key and I'm very certain about, which is actually here stored in a, in a you know, repository for a private key, which is password protected. Hence, when you want to open it and use your private key, usually you have to present your password, right? So that doesn't mean that your account, and let's come back to the overview, because this is something what students sometimes get wrong. So the, the, the kind of the key pair PPK I just showed you is a private, is a precious private key. This is something which might be username password protected. It is on your own system. Right? It doesn't mean that you now use username password to access the system. Right, That just means that you have uploaded the public key or you have talked to the administrator, they did it for you. And once you want to establish a connection, you use your private key, but to have sort of another level of security, usually you are asked if you have a matching you know, password to unlock this kind of key store, as we call that. And then the private key is accessible on this machine only. It has nothing to do basically with a remote connection. It's just use 
to then pass on this private key information to this remote machine. And because you have the matching private key to this public key, you are given access to SSH. Hence, we summarize. We have a specific supercomputer. It would have a host name, Elia, or Deep, as we have seen, deepfz ulichde We have a username, basically, that you have on this machine, given by an administrator called Morris. We will, one, we will see later in the demonstration how that works. Finally, you would use also the private key, right? Um, this was the sun, what I had here on my desktop with a different key setup, private and public key. I pick particularly the private key because that's what, what I'm going to use to actually enter the connection. And these are the three essential parts now to establish a connection. There's one thing I didn't talk about, which is not directly um, information. It's more the tool. Right, and you see that already here on the left side, there's a tool called Putty. Um, that is one that is quite a really, let's say, simple tool. And you can nicely and quickly install it, for instance, on the Windows environment. Uh, many of you that actually use a Linux derivatives or Mac have already an SSH client on the command line. So they might can use this. Um, I still recommend, especially, and this is now important, especially for the Windows user, please take a time and install Mobile Xterm. It's free. Um, we will use it in the course. And basically, it is much better than Putty um, in many ways. Um, and I'm actually not working for Mobile Xterm and not getting any benefits. I'm just saying that's a quite interesting SSH client. Um, while Putty is, is really, let's say, simple, and I would really recommend to do more by Xterm. And this will be also part of one of your assignments to, to do. Of course, there's nothing against the Mac users and the, let's say, Linux derivatives, um, Unix users already that just use the SSH on the command line. So this is fine for me too. And, and actually how to use it, you will see again, just to make the final point to this pointers here, how to use the SSH is quite nicely documented by our uh, team here, um, especially around Elia. But if you do this, of course, the keys that you want to lose, for instance, for Deep, it works the same way. You see everything is on the Unix command line here. Hence, you see again the importance of Unix because um, you can create keys for it. So um, it maybe makes sense to look through it, right? There are also some errors where you see why is this or that not working? What is the relevant of the .ssh that you will see? It's a typical, let's say, directory that is created and which has relationships to it, et cetera, et cetera. Again, because we're an HPC course and not a basic computer science course, we we take that a little bit as given here and point you a little bit to these um, you know, documentation. Now, having discussed this for long, because it's really essential for you to understand, right? So this, this graphic should be in your head, in your mind, the things I'm saying, you need a host name, you need a username, and then the key. This is important. Let's look a little bit into practice and how that works all when I a little bit demonstrate that now. And hence, um, as I said to you before, I use the mobile X term. Here in this environment, um, I'm basically here in a Windows environment that doesn't matter. But this means also I'm here in Iceland. So I want to now connect to the deep system in Germany. So you can have sessions there and SSH um, would be the one we use. You see many protocols are even supported, FTPs for file transfer and so on. But let's stick to the SSH. Um, and we said there should be a remote host, right? Which of course is resolved into IP addresses and so on, if you know a little bit about the wide, wide web. But let's start a little bit with the deep system, which is in the domain here of my center, ulich.de, um, in Germany. We also said we need a username. In this particular um, area, I am known as a real one. So you see, it's not always that you have the same username, like Morris here, Morris there, could be Riedel one there, could be Morris there, could be a complete different account, 1115 somewhere. So some things that you don't know or cannot even steer because the administrators will just give it to you. 
And then the third ingredient we learned is the private key. Now, there are different other um, points. As I said, X11 uh, refers to graphic forwarding and, and things like that. So don't worry about that. Just take it as granted. More important is that you really use a private key. And hence, I go here um, to this and use my private key repository. Right now, that's important. Again, remember, and maybe it's one of the final things I will say in this, the public key leaves your laptop. That's fine. Can be seen. It is put on the HPC system. What you need for the SSH client you installed, Mobile X term, is a private key. So this is a key store with my private key that is matching the public key. I have given and uploaded to the so-called deep um, administrators, and we have their system called UDOR. So it automates a bit the process. I will briefly go into that um, so that you understand that a little bit better. This is how we manage the users in, in Ulich. And it's important to realize, firstly, that I have the real one username that you already know now from my access. And then you see different system where I'm accessed to and manage the SSH keys. Again, you see now different keys here um, that I have on deep. And they are very specific, also protected, because it can only be accessed by a couple of very specific IP addresses, which is another level of security. But this is something where you um, essentially can manage, upload, and download the keys. And you will get access to this UDOR system as well, where you can then upload your key. Right? So this is something which will come as part of the lecture. And then you would have you know, perhaps different keys. You have, can have different keys in terms of from which IP addresses you use them, or maybe even different SSH keys if you want. So that is important. Um, to, to understand. Now, when we look into the public key um, and basically want to have this matching one um, over there, we basically see then um, that this key is also uploaded in the UDOR environment. Hence, um, we, we basically need to do that step before. And once we have this, we can then also assume and, and when you upload it, it will maybe take 15 minutes or so that this key is really all in the databases of the public, uh, you know, keys together. And then you can basically start using your private key, as I mentioned, to access the deep system uh, with real one. So let's hope that this also will work. And what we also know is that when you do it the first time, um, they will probably ask you for a passphrase, right? That's not done before here because I was also, um, you know, checking this before. So there's a little bit of temple time where this is not checked um, because I used the private key and unlocked it just uh, to prepare for this lecture. But in your case, when you have this private key repository, you can assume you will be asked for the passphrase. Now, that's the environment you know already from the first part of the course, right? So now we are back on deep. So essentially, you can connect now to the first part where we created this HPC course spring 2024, if you remember. And if we go inside there, we probably will find our um, you know, file that we created with a welcome message. So hence, we have successfully logged in by using the three parts of the information, host name, username, private key, bang, I'm in. So now I have the full power of the system and would now go ahead usually and would maybe also look at job scripts, um, would you know, basically examine my data, my applications I want to do, the module environment, if you remember, I want to see if my applications I want to do is maybe already pre-installed and want to do module load, all the things we have done in the first part of the lecture, and of course, um, you know, working with files. I will go quickly back to the um, slides here a little bit. So you have seen that really works with Mobile X term when you have an account. Um, you see also here, um, I put this nicely on the slide so that you see when you firstly use your private key uh, in a session or at some specific time, you will ask for a passphrase that you have to give in and then you basically get access. And it worked the same way as I was presented you. I actually uploaded in this UDOR system my public key um, then I know I was readle one. I use that information to connect 
And in the time where I do really the connection, I had to also unlock my key pair and give the private key to get then access to the system. Hence, there we are. Um, here's again an example how interestingly this, this keys can look on. There are some you know phrases here um, that basically are there that you um, cannot really recognize because there's a specific encoding of these keys. And, and this is something which uh, obviously you don't need to know by heart. That's why you have this public key information. And that's why it's also safe to give it away because you are the only one that has a corresponding private key. Hence, it should be never leaving your site. We have talked about this many, many times. I'm repeating this because we see again and again that the private key is also moving, which it should never do. So <clears throat> we have done this for the deep HPC system. So in a way, that's really the only repetition we have. We have seen the welcome um, uh, slide, uh, welcome screen that we um, have. And it is very important to look at this. So usually you get some information, what's happening today, is there any problem with the file system? So this is important to review every now and then. Um, some information you see here that some of the cluster nodes, for instance, have been migrated to Rocky 8.4 Linux, another Linux derivative. Um, sometimes there are problems, unfortunately, in these systems. Um, let's say example would be uh, the numbers of inodes would be, you know, um, reach the maximum and then the system cannot work anymore under your quota. So lots of things um, where this welcome screen gives you quite interesting information, like the parallel file system is down and so on. Now, the important message to take away, I think, is these two blue things. So we, we discussed a standard called SSH. So I use this deep.fz-ulichd and my username, reader1, to access it. Um, obviously, the private key is another part of it, but these are the two essential information. Now, what I want to, to really leave you on the table is, now we change these two things, but the SSH access, the modus operandi, how to access it, is all the same. Hence, I just exchange this now with Elia, and I exchange this with my username on Elia, which is Morris, and then I should get access also to the Elia system, right? Obviously, um, just as a short reminder, coming back to this slide, uh, of course, I talked also to the administrators of Elia. And actually, when I got an account, Morris, they told me, okay, Morris is my username. They asked me, what you guess next, my public key. So I presented them the public key that's safe also to send an email, no problem. Unless, you know, it's a private key. You always keep it yourself, right? If they would ask for a private key, which usually professionals don't do, then it's all good. Hence, we prepared that setup. So basically, if you now come to the Elia system that you also already know from the first part of the course, um, then we basically can see that um, the modus operandi, how to connect to Elia, is now exactly the same. And that's what I also want to really emphasize on. So no matter on which machines you go, let's say um, coming back to the EuroHPC systems, right? So we would have all of these systems we looked at, um, Lumi, we looked at Leonardo and, and all the systems, Mar Nostrum in Spain, uh, which is also quite um, explicit performance, being number three in the EU right now. Also, Lumi is quite important for Iceland. We are part of the consortium. So in the moment, the number one in the EU. So this is something where um, you will talk to the Lumi administrators. They will give you an account. They give you a username. Once you have a username, they will ask you what is the public key, right? So how you access this with SSH, right? And this is something which is incredibly important to understand that the same system is now having, of course, another host name, right? So let it be Lumi dot 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 at CSC, et cetera, et cetera. But the way how to access it will be the same for this and will be also, and now that's important to understand, not only for the test systems here in, in the Ulich Cooper Computing Center. Um, if you go to systems here, if you're interested, uh, it's part of the course materials, you can see also the other supercomputers. So this was a time, let's say, um, before the EuroHPC JU was existing. Hence, these are not really EuroHPC 
systems. But if you go to Juvels, for instance, the Ulich Wizard for European Leadership Science, you see it here in the physical space in the big hall. Um, you will see that this is also a huge supercomputer and the way how you access it. You see here some of the hardware configurations. Um, you can imagine having 2,000 nodes uh, with, you know, basically the CERN infrastructure in the Jewels cluster module. Hence, you realize it's the modular supercomputer we're talking about, right? The Jewels booster module. So it has also this cluster module and this booster module. And if you remember from the modular supercomputing architecture, what I told you in the beginning, in the last uh, lecture was really the cluster module usually is optimized really for high single thread performance, meaning cutting edge CPUs. And while the booster is more or less really on, on scalability, right? Scale out with GPUs, you will see here, each of these 900 nodes have four NVIDIA Ampere cards, MA100. So you have to multiply this 900 times four to have the amount of, you know, GPUs. In other words, around, you know, 3,700. Hence, these are also supercomputers and the way how you access them, the way how to operate on them would be using Unix with the SSH protocol. Now I told you something with the Jupyter Notebook access. This is more and more getting popular. That will come basically in another part um, in this kind of course lectures where you can then also access these systems, let's say with a Jupyter environment um, that I will just give you a, a, a brief, um, you know, as kind of tour, but we will explicitly talking about it when we also have your assignment. So here you see the different systems in a Uli Supercomputing Center, how you can access them remotely with Jupyter Labs. But these are basically accessible here for the HPC course you see when I say start um, without any SSH um, key that I have to present. It's a, let's say, web-based access, very beautiful. Um, and with this, of course, very, uh, very nice, but it has also limits. And as it's not the way that Jupyter is really installed on all the different systems. So when you go back to all the supercomputers in your HPC JU, chances are that the Jupyter environment is not there. So this is something where, um, you know, basically you can see that this is an optimized access and it's very much optimized in a way really for um, AI users. And we will make a specific point of it, about it uh, down, down, the, down the hill, basically, in our lecture series. Um, of course, also today, um, people can use it with other parts, so not AI, so also with physical sciences. It's also getting more and more attraction, but it's not the standard way of using it in, in these particular areas of science and HPC. It's more or less a very, very more recent addition to the way how you can accept it. I just want to give you that as an alternative way how to accept uh, access these systems and basically have a very streamlined way. But really depends a bit also on your user community, I have to say. So what people are, you know, usually using the supercomputer in a way, um, then you would say these different communities have their way of accessing it, have their job scripts, things that you don't know yet. We will talk about this in the next practical lecture, actually following the, the, the really introduction lecture one. Then we will talk about job scripts. You will edit this with your beautiful Unix commands you have learned today. And then, of course, we will also do this remotely on the systems where you want to run the job or the task on this HPC machine. We will also look into this much more, what these tasks mean that you want to do. Uh, and also, what is the problem of using this with a batch system? So basically standing in line to basically submit a job. Um, that is because many people are using the system concurrently. And you see that nicely here on the Jupyter JSC page. Right, how many people are currently using Jupyter JSC? How many people are on actually the Juvel system on the different, um, you see, modular parts? Who is on Jureka? It's another supercomputer I show you briefly, um, which is, you know, another way where you say, okay, another idea how SSH and Unix can be useful because there's another system. And that's how it really goes on and on in your career as a HPC expert or as a domain scientist using um, you know, HPC, 
let it be weather or environmental sciences up to physics or somewhere in the health sector, chances are that you will use very many HPC systems over the years. Finally, Jupiter has been loaded and you see here, interestingly enough, I never used my SSH key and can still access the HPC core spring with my Morris file. And I see the welcome, right? So there are other ways of accessing SSH is just one of it. That's also, I think, an important part to realize. But let's come back and what I didn't show to you yet, and, and this is really then the last thing I really want to leave you on the table here, how to access now Elia. Elia is our system in Iceland and we want to do it the same way as I just did with the deep system, but not with the Jupyter lab. Now I want to, of course, have our SSH again. Hence, when I'm here, remember hostname minus A is important to understand, am I really remotely? Right, so, and I can prove here, I'm at the deep system, not any more remote and can do exit here. That was basically our deep system. Now, when we go to Elia, we basically repeat what we did before. We gave the three specific types of information. So we have Elia. Obviously, it's not at Jülich, it's at how e is. And we have another username, which is also important. The usernames can vary. They're not the same on every system. Here, I am Morris in Iceland, and I want to use my private key, um, which is basically on my local machine in this key store, if you remember. And then I use this and have Elia, Morris, private key, go. And here I am. So um, I will increase the font size a bit so that you really trust me that I'm on Elia. Again, we see here also the welcome screen, which is quite important. Elia is part of the Icelandic e-research infrastructure, e-ray, that we recently had also a user uh, meeting and some presentations. And you see some other information about the file system amount of usage. You see only 13 terabytes is free of 200. So that means we have to clean up the data and other sort of information. And of course, when I say host main minus A, you will see I'm now at the login node of Elia. And uh, the concept of login node versus compute node is something we will discuss in one of the next lectures. So that would be too much to also put that all here in in this one lecture, but I hope you got the interesting information now that firstly, I never left my room. I'm still in Iceland. Um, I actually can access remotely the German system. I can access remotely the system I have at the university hosted with Elia. So, and this is basically possible through this SSH protocol as we have seen here now. I can do here my same work and obviously you can say, it's maybe wise for me already to create HPC course also here. And this is also important to understand. You see there's no, no directory, right? And why is that the case? Because we created the directory on the deep machine in, uh, in Jülich in Germany, not in Iceland, right? So that is an important part. These are two different systems. They have basically nothing to do with each other. So hence, here's no test file yet. There's no directory yet. Now we created it and can start there. The tab will be much faster here because we have just one HPC course here. And if you remember what I said the last time, um, this has um, basically historical relationship that we had the u system in the past, but it was basically getting out of service now. And we introduced now the Elia system for the first time in the HPC course. Hence, we have a beautiful and clean directory here. Still, you see with VI, I can still work. So I can create my Morris file with it. I can use the same instructions with the insert mode and say, welcome to our HPC course spring 2024 uh, in Iceland. I store it and will have my file in my directory. But now, of course, it's actually in the domain of the IRHPC. Uh, which is part of our Elia infrastructure, we will also talk about in later lectures. You can exit again to finish the connection. The most elements that I have presented in this demo um, are actually on the slides. Um, some of the web pages I looked up are just reference. So I looked them up to, for you. And they're of course in the lecture bibliography. So thank you very much for today.
short acknowledgement for my good team I have of PhDs and postdocs, and see you next time with a real introduction then to HPC.